And so the experts ask him, um, is it a concern that Alyssa's child is going to be first priority? In real life, he says, yes, it is a concern. That's huge, right? In the episode, he says, no, it's not a concern. I'm like, that is not what happened. Because then everyone's like, oh, he was there for you. He, you know, he saw the priorities. I'm like, guys, no, that's not how it happened. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. I have a special guest today. This is Alyssa Barmundi from season 10 of Married at First Sight Australia. Alyssa and I recently connected through my advocacy with the UCAN Foundation and making change in reality TV shows because she was on the show, went through this entire experience and completely misrepresented, completely manipulated, and really, quite frankly, treated like less than a human being during production and then once the show came out as well. So after talking to her, we thought about having a conversation here on the podcast and really get to know her as a person and then how she was manipulated on the show, including what her relationship was really like with her um, husband on the show versus what was portrayed. So we're going to get into all of that behind the scenes today and let Alyssa tell her story and tell her truth. And I hope that by listening to this story today and our conversation, this helps you look at reality TV with your eyes wide open. All right. Today, I have a very special guest, Alyssa Barmundi from season 10 of Married at First Sight in Australia. Alyssa is an avid baker and a mental health advocate, but you might know her from her catchphrases of, I have a child and I need attention. But most importantly, I think she is probably an absolutely wonderful mom and a new friend of mine. So Alyssa, thank you for coming on today. How are you? Thanks, Nick. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's Friday. We're heading into the weekend here. So that's nice. Yes. So good. Yeah. So what do you have planned for the weekend? Anything? Uh, so it's Saturday. Wait, what time? Yes. <laughs> it's Saturday morning. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm coming to you from the future in a Saturday morning at 9 a.m., <laughs> Um, and the sky is blue. The world has not been destructed. So please don't be, be afraid of the world ending. Um, cause we're still here on Saturday. I actually just got back from the U S I spent three weeks. Um, there was all these daily mail headlines that I was fleeing Australia after my villain edit, which is exactly what I did. And it was amazing. Um, so yeah, just, just got back yesterday fighting the jet lag and super stoked to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm so glad to have you and I'm glad that you made the time, but also that villain, like we're going to have to talk about that. But before we get into any of that, my favorite question to ask people is what did you, so I'm imagining when you were growing up, you did not think you would be a reality TV star on Married at First Sight, Ab but that's where you ended up. Absolutely <laughs> not. In Australia as well, marrying a stranger, <laughs> absolutely not. I grew up Mormon. Okay. So like when you're Mormon, you have to like, oh, well, I don't know. Some Mormons get married within two weeks and they get married in the temple. So I guess maybe you could marry a stranger that way. <laughs> but um, no, I never in my entire life would have expected my life to be here as it is now. But when I was a kid, I really, this is going to sound funny, but I wanted to be an actress, which I clearly am not. Um, I but you know what's funny about that is I, I always say the reason I ask this question is when people are young, they have these grand ideas of what they want to do. And it's like, be an actor, be an actress, be yeah. a writer, be yeah. an astronaut. Yeah. So it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I'm an actress on reality TV. So I guess my dreams did come true to become the villain. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be an actress. My dad was so against it. He did not want me to be in the public eye. Sorry, dad. Um, now he's my biggest fan. Oh, okay. I'm good. He is. Yeah, yeah. How's he's, he handling it? He's very, he's very excited for me. He was stoked. Um, but yeah, I did like acting classes and stuff. And then it just kind of all fizzled out because I wanted to, an agency wanted to sign with me. And my dad was, that's where he drew the line. And he's like, absolutely not. So I was like, cool. Oh. Um, and then my dreams kind of shifted to being a baker, which is also kind of where I am now. And yeah. so, yeah, I guess dreams do come true. <laughs> 
So what, t- talk about your baking for a minute. How did you get into baking? What was your process? And, you know, you bake cakes, right? Primarily? Yeah, I do. How- I bake, like, Alyssa bakes cakes. Um, so one of my fondest memories as a kid is my dad is a massive baker. He was like the cook and the baker in the house. Um, don't tell my mom, she'll tell you differently. But yeah, I just, I loved being in the kitchen. I remember being a kid and like pretending to be like on my own show and like, here's an egg, cracking the egg. Welcome back to my show, guys. Like so embarrassing. Um, so you should have been on a cooking show. I know. Oh, yeah. funny thing is I actually tried out for uh, Australia's Bake Off and got all the way to the end and then they didn't want me. So maybe I should have uh. gone on that. <laughs> That would have been the move. Although I can tell you, I've heard some horror stories from people on oh, Food Network shows same, too. Same. So look, it's I, f- I feel like the universe has a plan and I'm here for the ride and everything happens for a reason, whether unfortunate or fortunate. And, you know, it brings me to be here with you and talking about, you know, these really big issues, which I love to do. And that's kind of what I, what I want my newfound platform to do is to just bring awareness to things I'm really passionate about. I think that's admirable. And that's one of the things I've already picked up having known you for maybe a month now. Thank you. And I think that's awesome because it's, it's hard to have, it's hard to have integrity in this world. And a lot of people that do have integrity are the ones that end up getting screwed over because, because <laughs> you, when you're operating within like an ethical moral code and other people aren't operating in that, like you get stomped on, you get walked over, you get villainized and Totally. edited poorly and and I've, stuff, I've even so. said that before you know people ask you know what did you think of while you were filming like did you know how it was going to be and I said no like when I finished filming ask all my friends and family I thought I did really good you know unfortunately mm-hmm. Duncan and I didn't work out my husband on the show but I carried myself really well I thought that they were going to showcase you know this strong independent mother who cares a lot for mm-hmm. her child and yeah, I was super. So wait, you, you have a child? I do. I have a child. Oh. Um, I do not show <laughs> so show him on socials. People are like, there was this huge conspiracy in Australia on Reddit for a while. Like, does she even have a child? Like, yes, I do. He's just a toddler, so I'm just protecting his privacy from all of the psychopaths out there. Um, so yeah, I I always say that I was very naive and a hundred percent myself. What you see is what you get, and unfortunately, that is the perfect concoction of a mixture for production to be like prey. So I was absolutely, the more naive and the more open and the person that you are, if you are not strategic on these shows, production will prey on you and manipulate your entire story. That is a hundred percent true. And I think there's more and more people that are starting to learn that, which is good. But how did you even end up on Married at First Sight? And I mean, I can explain what it is, but it might be better if you explain what it is to some people who may not have seen it. Yep. So Married at First Sight, I'm pretty sure it started in like Norway or somewhere. And then there's little pops of it coming out. There's one in um, the US, there's one in England, and there's one in Australia. I feel like Australia is like the most popular because it's the most dramatized. So they actually slid into my DMs, my Alyssa Bakes Cakes Instagram, and they're like, hey, I was looking for a cake for my nephew. Um, By any chance, are you single? And I was like, what the hell is this? So I messaged her (laughs) and she's like, oh, do you want to be on maths? And I was like, absolutely not. Like I... And maths is short for married at first sight. Yeah, sorry. Maths is short for married at first sight. Um, And yeah, maths is... I used to be an avid watcher. I loved reality TV. I wanted to put an emphasis on the D there because I just look at it in such a different lens now. And yeah, they basically sold me the dream. I was like, look, I'm too sane for this show. Um, it's just, you know, I had just gotten separated from my marriage. It had been like about a year and a half from, I was actually married in real life. And they're like, Oh, you know, like we're just looking for real couples this time and we'll match you properly and your prince charming could be there and it could be a great way to showcase you know you (laughs) being a mother yeah they (laughs) they literally sell you a dream and you get sucked into the vortex and you're like oh what's the worst that could happen and so the concept of the show for people that don't watch it is you literally get married at first sight so there are three experts that pair you with your perfect match and they, it was a lengthy process. Okay. So we did probably four or five psychology tests, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, like a 200 long, 200 question long questionnaire about, 
you know, what you're looking for in a partner, all these different things. Obviously, they use that against some people. They are purposefully mismatched to create the drama. And then with a psychology test, now I have come to the realization is they learn what makes you tick. Um, I was very, I've always been very open about having anxiety and dealing with anxiety and told them, hey guys, by the way, I'm medicated for anxiety. And they're like, awesome, great. We can use that against you. And so... Well, the, and the crazy thing is, is when you're, you're sharing this with a psychologist, you're, you're like being open to say, Hey, like if this is going to be bad for me, you're trusting them. They're, you're trusting them to use this information in a, in a positive way. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I definitely want to delve a bit deeper into that as well, because it's absolutely shocking, you know, what they did to me. But yeah, these three experts pair you up as a perfect couple. You meet them for the first time walking down the aisle to your wedding. We are not married in real life in Australia. I want to make that very clear. Um, and it's just an experiment. And so, and I just want to say in the States, you do actually yeah, get married. You do. Yeah, so okay. when, when I told my dad that I was going on it, he was like, Alyssa, you can't get married again. Are you crazy? And I was like, dad, it's not real. It's just an experiment. And he was like, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, you meet them for the first time you go on a honeymoon and then they move you back into your own apartments in the city. So all of us live in these beautiful, small, tiny, confined apartments, which we have to ask for permission if we ever want to leave these apartments. Which think about that for a minute. Like yeah. you're a prisoner. Oh, hundred percent. You're a prisoner. Worse, worse and than they're... a prisoner. Prisoners have like recess and they can go outside and they're fed <laughs> they, and they can sleep. They get a phone they call. Want. Yes. Get a phone call. We, yeah. They take our phones when we film as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know how it was on Love is Blind, but we couldn't even have our um, mobiles, our cell phones with us when we were filming. So when production so we, was we in, couldn't we, uh, we couldn't have them in the pods or in Mexico. They took them for three weeks. They, they were clear about that. So that, that I will say, but so it sounds like you didn't, you didn't get the food and the water either. Oh, definitely not. I mean, captive. they would feed us, right? So they would feed us and it would be like this very small portion of whatever catering there is. But if you're not, uh, we would probably get one meal a day maybe. And we film for, you know, 12 to 15 hours a day. So it was not enough. And then, um, you obviously have to take a break from work to go on these shows. They don't pay you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was going to, you don't get paid. So we get paid $150 a day for the five days that we film. Um, and that's it. Wow. So it's, it's, and I mean, wow. it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Like I, I was, I'm probably more in debt now after maths than I was before. Um, because I still had to pay my rent. I had to take a break from work. So I wasn't getting paid from work. Um, and so, yeah. and your, your work is, is your own business, right? So I was actually an executive assistant. Um, so okay. my, like my little cake business is on the side and then I was an executive assistant, but I actually got fired, um, from my work, uh, just shortly after maths ended <laughs> a little, a little bit controversial. There was a restructure at work. So I don't want to say that, I mean, it's very hard to get fired in Australia. There's lots of uh, work policies that surround that. But, you know, I do feel like I was treated unfairly as soon as I got back. Um, I took a career break, which was approved. They knew what I was doing. And then when I got back, I was treated very differently, treated very poorly. Um, I think the, one of the first things that my boss said when I got back was, oh, there's lots of rumors going around that you weren't even going to come back. So I'm surprised you're here. And I was like, what a welcome. Um, what do you think so, that, why do you think that is? Do you think it's jealousy or do you think it's, because uh, people get so mad. People get really mad and angry. I don't know if he thought that I was like going to go off and, you know, be an influencer or something and like ride on this newfound D-lister fame. Um, nothing against influencers. I love them all. No, Great me respect. too. I feel like influencers work harder than a nine to five job. Um, but yeah, he just thought that, you know, Alyssa's been on this TV show. Why would she come back to work? And I loved my job. I was there for mm. seven years. Um, wow. And yeah, it was just really unfortunate the way that it happened. But again, you know, I feel like the universe kind of put this play into whatever it is. And I was able to go home for a few weeks when I, it was really, really needed. Um, I was getting bullied so bad online that I was scared to leave the house. When did you film? So we filmed August last, so August, 2022 to November. Oh, wow. Um, so it was three That was months, a quick turnaround. Three months of filming. And then we filmed the 
reunion in December, and then it started airing in Australia at the end of January. So wow. it went on until I think it was the end of April. And then I was like, peace, I'm out of here. <laughs> like, please get me out of this country because I was so scared to leave my house because as soon as I would leave, somebody would take a picture of me, put it on one of those gossip websites and be like, where's her child? Alyssa being spotted without her kid. Like I was literally getting bullied if I was with him or if I wasn't with him. Like it's just, it's unreal. It's crazy how much production can manipulate a story to make the viewer feel a certain way. And it's a bit scary that, you know, these people are kind of getting brainwashed by thinking that this is real life. The biggest thing I kind of want to bring awareness to is that people are always like, you can't blame it on the edit. And I'm like, nobody is blaming anything on the edit. It's just bringing awareness to how a reality show is filmed and is edited. There's so much context that is cut. For example, you know, our couch Well, you know, and a, and a, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Our couch sessions would go on for an hour and you would see maybe three minutes of that. And it was chopped and changed. Like you could see like, you could just Out see like for people to believe that this is real just blows my mind because you can literally close your eyes and listen to the audio and you can hear like the inflections and the differences in pitch that that was not one full sentence or you could see mm -hmm. like you know my facial expression or something on the couch but then like they would pan to the couch and I'd be like sitting on a different couch like it's just it's wild and the editing gets worse and worse every year on maps because it's so popular the drama, they don't even want to, they don't want love stories anymore. They, no, they have to escalate it. And they yes. put you in these manufactured yes. situations that you would yes. never be in in real life. Yes. And then you're already tired, you're already hungry, you're dehydrated, you're, your fight or flight's all over the place, your nervous system's out of whack, you're exhausted. And then yeah. it's like, here's a random stupid situation that isn't real life. Yes. Go interact. So- I don't know how it was on Love is Blind, but like on Married at First Sight, like you would have a few days and then we would have a dinner party with all of the couples. And then we would have a commitment ceremony where you and your partner decide to stay or leave. And if one of you says stay and one of you says leave, you have to stay. Or if you both say leave, you leave. And if you both say stay, you stay. But the thing is with Max is we weren't even allowed to talk to one another. The only person you could speak to was your partner. And so when you haven't been speaking to anybody and then, you know, you're sleep deprived, you're hungry, your anxiety is like, it, it's full blast. Yeah. Whole, like you're just in this bubble. Of course, at the dinner party, they want you to explode because that's what brings the drama. So we actually got in a lot of trouble um, multiple times because on the weekends we wouldn't film on the weekends. I would go home and see my son, my child. And, um, the cast would always get in trouble for hanging out with each other because there was so much content that happened off camera that production right. would scream at us and like, how are we going to explain this? It's happened off camera. You guys aren't allowed to talk to each other. You guys aren't allowed to see each other like literal prison. Yeah, it was the same for us. There was a there's a scene in Love is Blind where Danielle and I had to completely reenact a conversation that we had we had made up about off camera that honestly like the disagreement conflict happened off camera the makeup happened off camera they heard about it and brought it up and so it started an argument that is totally out of context i just literally watched the show again the other night and it's totally out of context and i'm just like what the f is like the point of us reenacting this scene it's so awkward it's so and they, yeah, they didn't want us talking. So we were, when we were in the pods, we were locked in our rooms. We didn't have room keys, hotel rooms. We weren't allowed to talk to each other. We couldn't leave because you don't have a key. And then we would sneak out to try and talk to some of the guys in the hallway, but you're terrified you're going to get caught because they want it all for the screen. Did you live, because you guys don't live in a pod, right? That's just where you like would chat to the other people. It's a set. Right. Yeah, that that and the lounge is a set. And then yeah. at night when you're done filming 18, 20 hours, you go get your couple hours of sleep at a hotel. Far out. That is crazy. <laughs> I crazy. Know. And of course, like I hate when people are like, Oh, you signed up for it. You knew what was gonna happen. Ugh. You knew how badly it was edited. Bro, I had no idea. The manipulation I tell people that edited. you don't know. <sighs> yeah. It you is. don't actually know. You could sit there and read. We could we can defame you. We can misrepresent you. We can edit you however we want. Yes. You can't do anything. Yes. And you're sitting there, like you said, where you're like, 
oh, I'm just going to be myself. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. <laughs> it is crazy. It's crazy. And like, if you do have a little bit of reservations about it, because you've seen previous seasons, you bring that up to production and they're like, that won't happen to you. We're t- we've changed. We really yes. want to, we want to create something that people, we don't want to do drama anymore. We want to showcase love whatever what a whole bunch of bullshit that they sell you because they knew that i was the perfect prey i had just gone out of a marriage i had a young child that i was going to be away for i struggled with anxiety i struggled with you know insecurity about dating as a mother and so let's pile all this up and then just use this all against her so she can react and we can just showcase her reaction so she can look like a psycho it's just and you you're reacting again without sleep, without water, without food. And oh, totally. Do you, so, do you think that they? I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you say it. So it's your word. Do you think that they used your psychological evaluation, your all your questionnaires and all that stuff, and create and created like who you were going to be before you even got there? Hundred zillion yeah. percent. They typecasted exactly who I was going to be. They would have used that against me. Um, even, oh, so I've spoken a little bit about this in my Q and a as well, because it's something that was absolutely shocking to me that I learned after filming. So I know love is blind doesn't have this, but I'm a bit weary about having any sort of psychological help on set. If it's perceived this way, part of so, production. Yes. Part of production. That's exactly right. So we had a mental health coach that is employed by the production company, Right. She comes to you as your friend. She's a beautiful lady. I don't want anything against her because I obviously know that this is her job, right? But she comes to you as your friend. She's there as like, you know, your confidant. Whenever I had multiple, multiple panic attacks, which I know Danielle had as well, I would walk off set, which A, they edited to be a tantrum. So anytime you see me crying and overreacting, that was a full panic attack. In order for me to even have that much anxiety I'm medicated for anxiety, okay? So for me to have a panic attack while medicated for anxiety speaks volumes about the amount of intense pressure and environment that I'm in. So I would walk off set. Um, the mental health coach would come and speak to me and like try to get, you know, what's going on. What's, what's a mental in- health coach? Mm-hmm, great question. Not a therapist, I'm guessing? We, we did have a psychologist as well. But the same thing, he would come over, hey, are you okay? What's going on? Would kind of talk me down off the ledge. But then little did I know, all of the information that I was giving them was going straight back to production. So producers were learning what was triggering me so they could bring that up later and have me snap again so they could get the trigger that they wanted. They could get the emotion that they wanted. They could get the scene that they wanted. They could get the character that they wanted so they can manipulate it perfectly. It is so disgusting and I felt so violated learning this that they were literally using everything that I was saying to somebody that I thought I would I was trusting I've been in therapy for over 20 years I will shout at the top of the mountain that every single person should go to therapy it is like going to the gym for your brain but for somebody to use that in a profession and use that against somebody that is so mentally unwell in a situation they should have said Alyssa you're mentally unwell right now. You need to get off the set. You're not okay. I would have yeah. said, awesome, let me go home. The amount of times I tried to quit and I was like, please just let me go home and see my baby. I have all these reservations about the person that I matched with. I'm not well. I'm not doing okay. I need to go home. And they're like, you're doing great, babe. We see that Duncan is, you know, maybe not genuine. You need to call it out. You need to expose it. You need to just keep being you. Australia is going to love you lol like r.i.p to me because even after our final vows which were like three pages long and of course they only showed the little parts um of course executive producers and the head of channel nine came over to me and they're like thank you so much Alyssa, for being so honest and vulnerable in yourself you are going to be a star australia is gonna love you you know you did such a great job and i was like thank you and then look what they did shocking, disgusting, violating. Like it's just, it's unreal. Well, I think the the thing that's so damaging and people, you know, the, to stick to the, you signed up for this bullshit. I hate it. The, I hate it. I get it all the time too. And especially now with the foundation and, and, you know, I want to touch on something that I, I push for with that too, but you don't sign up for something that you didn't say 
without context or you said in different context or in a different scene and you don't say that or i'm sorry you don't sign up for that even if it says in there we can we can defame you we can misrepresent you all that stuff your mind is not putting together that you're going to say something in one scene or something's going to happen in a scene. And then they're going to put that scene way later to make it look way worse. Yes. And I think that's what people don't understand. That's what I'm talking about. The editing and the manipulation of the content that they use. I talk a lot, clearly. So like they have <laughs> so much content of me that they could chop and change and do whatever they mm -hmm. want. And like, it's just, it's on, I never in a million years would have known. And then it also makes me feel really guilty for, you know, watching past reality TV shows and being like, oh, like, you know, she's a bit like, oh, I don't know if I would have done that way. Or, you know, I don't like mm -hmm. her because that probably wasn't that person. Like everyone is so, they're just care. We're literally characters in a play. So that's what, that's what's actually really helped me deal with the bullying is that when people say these really awful things about me, it's like. You guys can have that perception of me because the person you're watching on TV was not me. That's not, yeah. You have to almost disconnect yourself and think of it as like, this is a performance that I did. Yes. And I was playing this character. But since you since you brought it up, you recently got a DM that you shared that I think is deplorable. And I want to read it and then read your response and then yeah. read her response. Yep. Let's and the reason I want to do this is because... So I have learned through lots of therapy to be responsive, not reactive, but I get very reactive to people who are mean on the internet because it's a projection of themselves. And it's just like, look in the mirror and ask yourself, why are you saying this? What's going on in here? What's going on in here? And I'm touching my heart and my brain for people listening. What's going on in there that makes you think you need to type something mean to someone on the internet that you don't even know? Yeah. You don't even know. And you're known 100% for this, however many, you know, it's 10 episodes. So what are you in? 20 minutes each episode, maybe. So a couple hours of your life, people have seen that's edited, chopped up to tell a story that isn't even what really happened. And that's what people know you for. And people need to remember that. But this person um, wrote to you, you had just got, you mentioned, you just got back from uh, your, your time in Utah, in the States, and you were commenting on being jet lagged in your story. And someone wrote back to you and said, damn, I was hoping your plane would crash. Yeah. So to put that into perspective, even if that person's being facetious and dramatic, you're wishing death via plane crash, which by the way, you weren't the only one flying on your plane. Correct. So to get rid of you- Right. So to get rid of you, because for some reason, this stranger has these incredibly strong, hateful feelings towards you because of some TV show and then wishing a plane crash, which is an, a global tragedy when that happens. So many people lose their lives when that happens. And then you said, hi, Emily, why do you follow me? And gave her a little heart. Yeah, a little hand and heart. Yeah, the hand heart. And her response... Because I like to see how you fuck up your life, just as he said you would, LOL. So this Emily person is literally f hate following you. Yeah. Which, fine, if you want to hate follow someone to, to watch what you think is the train wreck of their life because you saw a few minutes of, go for it. But to comment wishing death on people, not just you directed towards you, but death upon all those people on that plane. What is going on with this Emily person? I, so ugh, I, I wrote her back after that. Cause I saw that she had seen, um, the message and then let me see. Cause she has since changed her name and I think blocked me, but I think I might be able to still find the message. Um, I do think it's funny too, that she's blocking you because it's, it's interesting her. to me because you outed her. Yeah. yeah. And she thought that she, that would never happen. And now she has a little, little, little bit of tiny information of what it's like to be in the public eye on social media. Yeah. Yep. And the thing is, right, is that like, I never wanted her. I, and I said this on my stories this morning is that when I share this type of stuff, it's not an intent to encourage other people to look her up, to bully her, to message her. That's not my intent. 
My intent is to say, look, have an opinion of me. That is totally fine. That is valid. You are, everyone is more than welcome to have their opinion on anyone. But mm -hmm. to one, follow someone, to two, write a message to somebody, that person that you hate so much and hit send, that is intent to hurt. Go say that to yeah. your boyfriend. Go say that on Reddit. Go say that on Facebook. Go say it in a comment that I'll never read. But to say it directly to me, that is hurtful. And that is what has got to stop because that is yeah. full bullying. It is hatred at its most purest evil intent. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. I'm always shocked by the online bully mob, which is what I, I call them. And the things that people say are, are just, and I, you know, I, I definitely did not get, you know, a villain edit or anything like that, but you know, there was a lot of commentary on my relationship and people would say horrible things. I had people telling me that I should kill myself. I know Danielle's had that stuff too. You know, people are just, just awful and they say the worst things to you. And I just, for the life of me, I can't. And again, I'm very reactive. Sometimes I'll just be like, or when some, my favorite too, is when someone's like unfollow. Yeah. I'm like, Thank you for the engagement yeah. on the way out. Yeah, Thank you for exactly, the one, exactly. two, three, Thank four, five, engagement. six, seven, eight, nine, ten <laughs> clicks where you could have just hit the unfollow button. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. But yeah, I, I just don't I don't get it. And there are some people that I I do like I, I see like a misunderstanding in the what they're saying, and I will try to respond and like change their mind. And sometimes it works, other times yes. it doesn't. Yes. It, it's just the the design the mask that the internet gives to people the mask that is perfect because yeah the, the trolls are always the same too right they have no grammar they don't know how to spell they don't use punctuation and it's always whenever i click on them it's always like in god we trust or like you know what i mean like some sort of like bible verse or some sort of like um oh the stairway to heaven or like some sort of like oh be kind hashtag be kind and it's like oh i know what like you've just sent yeah. me the worst message on something that you've seen. Like it's just, it's wild. And I never in a million years would have expected to receive this amount of hate. And what scares me, because I know it's happened in the UK multiple times of reality stars taking their own lives after the bullying and the bashing that they get after. Three show. people from Love Island, three people, two cast members, and then the, the host of the show. And by the way, I, there's people from The Bachelor that have taken their life via suicide or lost their life via suicide and, or death by suicide. I don't want to – I just don't want that to ever happen again. Yeah. And to, to reference one other thing, like one of the things that I've called for – and I, I don't know. I know you're in Australia. You don't have it here. But we have the NFL here. And one of the things that they started instituting a couple of years ago – or yeah, a couple of years ago is an independent neurologist – has to clear someone who's suspected of a concussion because it would be team doctors before that. And team doctors would be like, eh, it's the playoff. We got to send Tom yeah, Brady in, even though we think in. he's. But now that independent neurologist has to clear them. And that's how I envision this happening for reality shows is there's an independent mental health professional that's going to come in and say, Alyssa's not well right now. She's not filming today. And we'll check in and do a checkup with her tomorrow to see if she's ready to go tomorrow. Or we'll give her 30 minutes and see how she feels and I'll work with her to help her regulate. Whatever that is, that needs to be done independently because I, you know they're just feeding that back to production. Or at the very least, it's a facade. At the best case scenario, it's a facade to say, hey, we have psychologists and mental health support. This is, that's right. Because I think this is the first season. I don't know if last season or this first season that they had <clears throat> the mental health coach and the psychologist on set. So I feel oh. like, yeah, I feel like it was something that they're like, oh, let's change this so we don't get in trouble anymore, but let's still use this to our advantage. They were probably like all at a board meeting. They're like, hmm, what do we do about this? I have an idea. Let's have a psychologist that will actually fuel us with more content that we need and it'll look better and it'll make our contestants feel safe so they don't actually leave. Like the amount of times that I would go home um, and then I just wouldn't come back. Like I had to literally tell them, hey, I'm not coming back for the weekend. And like, no, like, you know what I mean? Like you can't say that it's just, I don't know. It's just absolutely yeah, wild crazy. to me, like how these people are treated. And what's funny is that 
So I ghosted after like one production. So I actually haven't watched my entire um, series, which by the way is 36 episodes, um, not 10. So I Oh, it's 36? It. Yeah, 36 episodes. And I was like, I had oh, no oh, idea. Are they yeah. an hour each? Uh, yeah, an hour. I think it's an hour and a half, but an hour with, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of time. Um, oh, maybe I'm thinking I saw season 10 because it was season 10. Maybe that's why I was thinking it was 10 yeah, episodes. Yeah, yeah. That's insane. 30, that's 36 so episodes. It's it's Ooh. a full-time job to watch it, um, which is probably why people get so invested, right? And I get that. Like yeah. they, they want to manipulate viewers into feeling how they're feeling, which is... When viewers think that there's just a documentary crew following you around as you're going about your everyday life, and it's not that. You're literally put in situations, put on sets, on location, and told what to talk about, told what not to talk about, you know, it's so. And the other thing I love when people say are like, they don't put words in your mouth. Yes, honey, they do. They literally do. They literally do. When you are having a conversation with the producers, we call them voxies. I don't know if you call them that, but it's like, um, just like you and the producers. We call the them cameraman. OTFs. Yeah. They're OTFs on the flies. Yeah. 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 So same kind of thing on the fly. Like we would do probably four or five voxies a day that were 30 mm -hmm. minutes each. And the producer would just keep asking you questions over and over, but like you almost had to answer it like a Jeopardy question. Like you had to say mm -hmm. what they were saying along with your response so they could use literally all of those words. They can make you say those words. I promise you. I promise you. They get you to feel a type of way and start to lead you down a path so your mind starts thinking, oh, maybe it is that or oh, you know. And then you're saying things with their literal words. So I, I know there were times and I, I'm pr I was pretty clear most of the time and I put my foot down on a few things, but there were times where I would say something and they'd be like, okay, but say it like this. And they'd literally yes. give it back to you verbatim. Yes. One, of the one of the producers would always be like, she would ask you a question and it's funny because if my math stars watch this, they'll know exactly who I'm talking about. She would say it and then she would kind of like be repeating your words. Like when you would talk, you know, when somebody says, like if you were talking, they'd be like, they like kind of mumble the words with you. And then she would say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe is it like this or this or this? Like she kind of suggests words to you. And then it's like me, the gullible, naive me is like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, maybe it is blah, 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 blah. And then she's like, bing, gotcha. Like unreal. And the thing that's really sad is that you think that these producers are your friends and they care about you. And it just sickens me, like, because I don't want to not believe that my producer didn't care about me, right? Yeah. But it just, it's it's sad. So I ghosted. So, yeah, so my series, um, once my story started to turn, I couldn't watch it anymore. Um, it made me physically so unwell that I literally, like, would crawl up in a hole. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing this to me. Like, what next? Is, how are they going to change the next story? Like, I was Well, and then you know if there. it's happening in the middle, it's only going to escalate. Yeah, because we don't get to see anything beforehand. So this mental health coach literally had to call me. So it airs four days a week in Australia. So uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, four days a week. And... um she had to call me and give me a rundown of what was going to happen on the episode because my mental health was not well enough for me to actually watch what they were doing to me. I wanted to ask you about that, yeah. but you can continue what you're saying, but I yeah. want to hear like, what was your mental health journey during filming? And then like any, anything before it came out? Cause you had a few months and then what happened as the show went on for weeks and weeks? I'll definitely get to that. Cause I feel like this ties into it. So yeah. once I figured out that the mental health coach, even while airing she was taking what I was saying to her and going straight back to production and going back to the publicist because I didn't want to do I, I stopped doing any publicity I stopped going to any events I stopped doing anything because anything that I was saying or doing was being created into a headline and then that would fuel more hate and then production was doing absolutely nothing to mitigate these online trolls and the comments and all that kind of they stuff. They don't do any. They don't even delete it off their no, own social media. No, they don't delete it off their social media because they want. I'd get tagged in Netflix stuff and it's like cruel. It's like, hey, Netflix, delete this. Yeah, they don't. They absolutely do nothing. So all of our comments are off on our own pages, but all of the comments are on on the maps page. And I would say to her and I'm like, she's like, just don't read it. And I'm like, dude, it's so easy. That's for their you training to, for yes. you. It's so easy for you to say, don't read it. It's not happening. But when I'm going out in public and people are taking sneaky photos of me and posting them on the internet and then other people are sending me things like, hey, did you see what this person said about you? Do something about it. 
So then I was like, you know what? Stuff you guys. I don't want to hear anything from pr production again. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to speak to you. I want nothing to do with you. Leave me alone. And then mm -hmm. this is when, so this is where it gets wild, right? And so I would just, I would go. So there was a psychologist that I was talking to after the show, which the mental health coach paired me up with. She was very, very kind, very nice. She was completely, the first thing she said to me was, I am not affiliate with Endable Shine, which is the production company or Channel 9. And I was like, thank God. I felt so safe with her. She was she was actually someone that probably saved my life while it was airing, 100%. Oh and so I was just I'm getting... So sorry. Uh, it's all right. It's okay. Um, I was just getting so... You know, when you're in a depression and when you're in like this anxiety spiral, you just keep going down and down and down. So I just, I wouldn't mm -hmm. respond to production at all. The mental health, health coach called me and she's like, hey, Lisa, please, I'm just checking in on you. Can you please just let me know you're okay? And I was like fuck you. You don't care about me. So then the first time that I heard from an executive producer after I had finished filming, sent me a text and was like, Hey, Lisa, can you please let us know if you're well within 15 minutes? Otherwise we are sending a police to do a welfare, welfare check on you. The first time I heard from a producer was because they thought I had killed myself. That's not even because they, they, yeah, no. trigger warning there. That's not even because they care. It's because they're no. worried. She's worried about themselves. They're worried about yeah. that the next headline is going to be about themselves and their production company will go down. So I went off at her. Do you think she responded? Nope. Haven't heard from her since. She called, she tried to call my parents, which was like 3 a.m. in Utah. And of course they didn't answer. And then my mom rings me like two hours later and she's like, oh my God, are you okay? I just got a call from the executive producer saying that she can't contact oh you. And I was like, dude, like you guys literally don't care until you think that I've done something. Now you care. That's going to be bad PR. Yeah, exactly. They don't care about your life or your child's life or your yes. family's life or anything. It's disgusting. About... Mm. So going back to your question about how my mental health was, um, I've always been, you know, a big advocate about therapy and I have gone through a lot of therapy in my life. My dad came out as gay when I was the ripe old age of 16 and as a mo very Mormon family in Utah, that would be oh crazy gosh. for anyone, let alone a little Mormon girl in a perfect Mormon family. Um, honestly, it's the best thing he could have ever have done because now my family is just... If he's happy. He's happy. He's himself. He is thriving. Um... And it's just, it's brought my family closer together than ever. But that's kind of when I started to go through a lot of therapy is just to kind of deal with these emotions, A, that I was having as a 16 year old girl and B is- I was going to say you're 16, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't get much worse than, yes, than the exactly. emotional. So that's when my love of therapy kind of started. Um, and I yeah, have loved it ever since. So I had worked on myself a lot and I was in a really good mental state. Through COVID, you know, Australia had a really, really hard time with COVID. We you were, guys went wild. We were locked away COVID. for a yeah. long time. <laughs> That's when, you know, my, my first marriage was kind of starting to dissipate as well. So, you know, my marriage was breaking down. Was that because of COVID or was that before COVID? Um, a little bit of all, all of the things together. But, you know, I was, I was kind of trapped in Australia. Couldn't go home and see my family. Um, I had just had a baby as well. So dealing with like postpartum depression and anxiety, marriage dissipating and COVID, I was fucked. <laughs> and so that's when, you know, I reached out to my GP and was like, I'm not well. Um, I got on some anxiety medication, which is the best thing ever. I'm not, you know, a drug pusher, but it has done really well for me. Hashtag Lexi Hey, it helps a lot of people. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people. And um, yeah, so I was in a really good position pre-mass. And that's what I mean when I was talking to production, you know, when she was going through, you know, what the steps are for like the recruitment process and that kind of stuff. Casting process, I should say, was recruitment. But I was, I was really in a good spot. And then I feel like once math started, I just, while we were filming, you know, I would get these gut instincts that I wasn't doing the right thing or that I should leave or, you know, I was having second guesses about my, my partner and, you know, a lot of things like that. And I just kept getting talked back into staying. And so my mental health was starting to depreciate a lot. It's crazy how they talk you into staying. Not you. It happened to Danielle yeah, and I too. Yeah, I know. Where we were just like, no fucking chance. And then before and then you like, know it, you're filming you're again. Still there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I'm leaving. And it's like, a, it's honestly like a toxic relationship. Like you, 
so many people are like, why did you not leave? And it's like, you clearly have been in a toxic relationship because you cannot just leave. You can't. Well, and for us, they had our IDs. Yeah, they had our IDs, our passports. We had nothing. We had nothing. What? So we were, so we were in LA and in Mexico without, a, they gave us our passport right before we went through security. And then we put it back in a bag when we got to the other side. What? So we had no IDs. We had no credit cards. We had no cash. We had no food. We had no phone. We had no access to the internet. The only reason that, I, I think of it this way. Jeremy from, Jeremy says this. He's, he said, imagine breaking out in Mexico or in LA and you run, you're running for your life because you got to get out of there. You can't take it anymore. You find someone, you're like, I'm being held hostage by a reality TV production. Who the hell's going to take you seriously? But that's what they do. Yeah, they do. They absolutely do. The way they are literally, these pro- producers and production companies are literally the biggest narcissistic manipulators of all time, of all mm-hmm. time. The things they do and the things they say and the things they gaslight you with such a trendy word but it's just it's unbelievable what goes on behind the scenes and that is what is so shocking that viewers don't know um you know after my q a there were so many people that messaged me that were like holy shit you know i had this different perception of you when i watched maps but i've just watched your q a and i am floored floored and they're like i I, what's so beautiful is i'm getting so many messages now of people apologizing to me because they felt some type of way about me watching me. And then now they're actually seeing the real me and they're like, wow, you are completely not that person. I was like, yes, thank you. I know. That's awesome. Do you, about, uh, about production though, like, why do you, do you think, I mean, we alluded to this, it's the drama, but like, why does it have to be so dramatic, like over the top, unrealistic, dramatic, like you don't write, like this would be satire in yes. in Hollywood. Yes. yes, it's unreal. There was um oh, who was it that did the reel um that part that you can just repost it and she was like um really entertaining TV and it's like really Oh, ethical. Dr. Isabel. Yes, yeah. love her, obsessed with her. That was such a perfect like human beings are so dramatic as it is. You don't need to facilitate this drama. You don't need to manipulate the drama. I'm telling you, the way that I lived Married at First Sight, they could have just filmed it of what happened and it would have been just as dramatic without ruining everyone's lives because that was the real story that had happened. And let let it be real. It's going to be more relatable too. And I, I, you know, one of the things I said was, imagine a scenario in Mexico where, which by the way, for us, in Mexico, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. If they had two psychologists on set, like they claimed, where the hell were they when someone had a panic attack? Mm. Second of all, imagine a scenario where it's like, you're in this new relationship, your partner just had a panic attack for the first time, right? And then there's a mental health professional that's like, here's how you, here's how you guys can navigate this together. Let's build some skills. So you're building, you're, you're building positive you know, habits in your relationship instead of negative, toxic ones. But at the same time, you're showing a lot of people who maybe haven't had access to therapy or maybe have a partner that's struggling or a partner that doesn't know how to deal with it. And like, that's entertaining too, but it's also informative. Yes. It is the perfect way to highlight mental health and mental health struggles in a relationship and give other people the tools on how to navigate that. Perfect opportunity. But instead, they don't. And that's exactly what happened with um, Duncan and I on the couch a few times is, you know, I had a massive panic attack, ran off set. It was classed as a tantrum. And he did this whole dramatic, like running after me, but like wasn't actually running after me. And then... Did they tell him to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh I do not know. Um, And that's the thing. Like now it's just me kind of like, I don't know what was real. Do you know what I mean? Like I have no idea what was real and what wasn't. When you watch this back, it's like gaslighting. Yeah. Like I watched these scenes just the other day because I was filming something and I'm watching them and I'm like, God, I forgot this isn't how this happened. Like I didn't, I still, and then you're like, oh, did it happen that way? Did I say that? There's one scene in the pods where I'm like, I definitely did not say that to that person. That is a totally different conversation with a totally different person at a totally different time. Because it, like it's so out of context. Yeah, I journaled a lot on set, which I'm so thankful for. I spoke to my sister and my dad every single day via text, which I'm so thankful for. Because then I go back and I'm like, 
wait, that, I swear to God, that didn't happen that way. Like, it's almost like, what's that funny thing? I can't remember what it's called, but it's almost like, if you remember like the Berenstein Bears or the Berenstein Bears, and it's like- a, Yeah, the Mandela a, effect. Yes, man, it's like, <laughs> yeah. is this a Mandela effect? Am I remembering totally. something that isn't right? So perfect, perfect example of how they can manipulate a storyline is one of my biggest insecurities is, you know, why would this 38-year-old good-looking guy, never been married, doesn't have kids, why would he want to settle down with me as a single mom that has quote-unquote baggage? I do not look at children as baggage. My son has taught me to be resilient. He's taught me unconditional love. It is like the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And so the experts ask him, um... Is it a concern that Alyssa's child is going to be first priority? In real life, he says, yes, it is a concern. That's huge, right? In the episode, he says, no, it's not a concern. I'm like, that is not what happened. Because then everyone's like, oh, he was there for you. He, you know, he saw the priorities. I'm like, guys, no, that's not how it happened. Look, I will put my hand up and I will be accountable. And I say, and I will say, did I do and say things that I am not proud of? Absolutely. I watch back and I'm like, damn, I should have handled it that way. I should have said this, that this way. Um, you know, at reunion, I did apologize to him and the whole cast because I'm like, holy shit, this has turned me into a person that I was not. But that's by design too. And I I feel like what happens when you're not getting sleep, you're not getting food, you're off. And just at the very best case scenario, you're off of your routine and your schedule that works for you. And then to sit there and be reactive and then the producers are going to be like, say this, or we're not going to be able to stop filming until you say this. And it's like, you're so exhausted and you're not in the right state and you're triggered and you're tired and some, you know, you're with someone who's behaving differently. It sounds like in your case, off screen versus on screen, which is its own form of gaslighting. Like, what are you supposed to do? It's like an interrogation, right? So it's almost like I watch a lot of true crime and the interrogation tactics that some policemen do to try to get a resolution of a crime when this person actually didn't do anything, but they're trying to use all of these tactics to, to make him say that he did it when he actually did it. Like it is, ex- it is every single detrimental, inhumane practice that like reality TV producers just gather in a bucket and they're like, here's our tool bucket that we're going to use to ruin your guys' lives. Like, it's just, it's crazy. I wish there was another word that I could use. And the sad thing is somehow across the globe, reality TV has escaped any kind of laws, any kind of employment laws, any kinds of defamation laws, any kind of slander laws, any type of libel laws. And how? How? And it's, it's because the exploitation is and the damage and the trauma and the the brainwashing of telling people you're going to get a lot of followers you're going to make a million dollars a year you're going to be famous all this stuff that people take as a payment for being treated like you're not a human being not given basic human rights not given mental health support when you're in this extreme situation where every day you're making huge life altering decisions that are going to affect you in your case affect your son affect your relationship and it's just it's just all done exploitation, all the exploitations done just to get an entertaining show. And reality TV can be entertaining. As you said, people are dramatic without the escalations and without damaging people to the point people are, are coming out of this and they're never going to be the same again. Never, never going to be the same. They instill so much fear into us that we are scared to speak up. We are scared to to say, like you said, our basic human rights. We're scared to talk about our own experiment. It is literally a toxic relationship to AT, tenfold. And it's just so terrifying that you think, oh my God, am am I going to get a call from production because I just posted this? Or am I, they don't give a shit. You know what they're doing? They're planning the next season to, to be even more dramatic and to, it's all about the money for them. It's all about the money. They don't give a shit about the participants. But how can we change that? Because, hey, I love reality TV, okay? I think it's entertaining. Do I look at it with a different lens now? Absolutely. Do I think that there still can be really entertaining and dramatic TV shows with good practices that protect us as human beings? Absolutely. 
And that's I what agree. I love so much that you are doing about this whole foundation and about just bringing the awareness of the toxicity behind the scenes. Well, thank you. And I think that that was like the big thing for me is, is, and I actually, I wrote this down. I listened to you on the the Today Show. I think it is, do you, were the you on the Today Show? Yes. And I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah I remember. It was so, so funny too. Cause you were like, I'm fangirling and yeah. like kind of. <laughs> I literally watch them every day and I like walk on set and I was like, oh my God, these are like celebrities that I'm walking into. Like, this is crazy. Oh, I know. I've had a few of those moments too, where I'm like, oh my God, I'm totally fanboying. And they're just yeah. like, well, we're fanboying or fangirling. And it's like so funny. But um, yeah, and I think that that's what I, I kind of, I heard you say on there, you care about human beings. And when something isn't right, yes, you have to call it out. human code. Yes. I do not. Yes. I don't care about boy code. I don't care about girl code. It should be about human code. If something is yep. unjust and is not right, you should call it out. You shouldn't be protecting the boys. You shouldn't be protecting the girls. You should be protecting yes. the human itself. And that was so like, hell yeah to me because my whole thing is very similar. It's like, well, somebody should say something. And at some point I was like, wait a minute, somebody should say something. I'm somebody, I'm going to say something. And I think that's what was my final like motivation to be like, you know what? Like I, I am a, a human being first. I think of people as human being first, even people that I don't like, I don't want to be around. I recognize they're a human being and they deserve happiness and they deserve basic quality of life and they deserve people that love them and they deserve, totally. they deserve love, all of that stuff. Doesn't mean I have to like them. But what this is doing is we're calling a light out to this industry that is unregulated, this industry that exploits people. It's basically the hunger games at yeah. this point where it's yes. like, for, and then you don't hear from them again, unless they need you for something or can make another dollar off of you. I haven't heard, I haven't heard from anyone from the show. And since they told me that I wasn't going to, they weren't going to sue us for getting a divorce when we were contractually obligated to stay married. What? Yeah. How yeah. long were you contractually obligated to stay married? Um, without looking back at it again, exactly. It, I believe it was one year. Fuck. No, it was one year till the show aired, but then after the altar, um, is, which is three more episodes came out and I, I was unclear because we separated right before, after the altar came out, like two weeks before, and then it leaked right before. And I was very worried about that. Cause I was like, I don't want to get sued for I don't even know how much yeah and then you know they were like oh don't worry we're not going to sue you we're not going to make you stay married if you don't want to be married anymore and I'm just like okay since then I got you know my name dragged through the mud I lost my job I like d didn't ever hear from anyone I'm like this show ruined my life yeah they don't they do not care and the fact that we were even before separating and divorcing like I had it in my head. We're a success story to this stupid experiment that you have. You have to have success stories to keep doing that. Even like that framework of like, if you guys are going to keep making money on this show, you have to have these success stories. Therefore, you will support them because it's financially beneficial to you. And they don't care. They wouldn't have cared if we showed up to the reunion and just were hot off each other, screaming. They would prefer that than us showing up there as a success story. They're probably like, oh, you guys have broken up. This is going to be great. Another storyline for them. I know. It's just, it's gross. It's, um, it's depressing. But that's what I think, like, with the You Can Foundation, what we're doing is we're driving awareness, but we're also making sure that the immediate need of having reality TV contestants. We were called contributors, by the way, which oh, is God, even worse. Like worse. <laughs> it's totally worse. <laughs> Reality TV cast members, um, they need mental health support, especially in across the globe in these shows that that are damaging people like like you. And so we, you know, we put a network of over two hundred mental health professionals here in the states right now to to help with that. That want to be in that network so we can help people pair. Because you know, sometimes the hardest thing is finding one, starting. Sometimes it's like typing it into Google to get started. So we're trying to help with that, and then we're also. Um, working with a bunch of entertainment lawyers. We have over 30 firms that have reached out and we are 
working through these contracts to see out what is legal, what's enforceable, what's not enforceable. And these are the things that are going to really help us drive change in the industry. And then on top of that, there's just a lot of advocacy that I'm doing that we're, we're recruiting other people to do, other people want to do. Um, and we're just going to force the issue and say, hey, like, you know, every other entertainment like branch of entertainment has a union and they're all paid fair wages with laws around yes. that. They're all have guaranteed breaks and fines and everything. If they don't, they all work reasonable hours or make an excessive amount of money if they need to go over production and they all have access to food and water. They all are, are treated with dignity and respect. And sure, sometimes someone's mental health gets ruined from a role or, or an experience and that's going to happen. But you, it's far less than in reality TV. So we are going to force the issue, all of us together. This is not about me. I, I honestly don't want to be doing this. I just feel like somebody has to. Um, and we're going to force the change. And the change is going to come from all of us that have experienced this and all of our fans that are like, this isn't right. And all the fans of reality TV that want to see ethically produced shows. And that's what we're going to get to. And we're going to get through it from a number of ways and a number of ways that I'm not able to share yet here, but there's a lot of great things going on and we're going to force this change because what happened to you happened to Danielle. What's happened to so many people that ain't right. It's not morally right. It's not ethically right. It's not legally right. Yeah. So, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Love what you're doing. So excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. And thank um, you. Yeah, I, I'm so stoked to see the changes because I cannot wait to watch a reality TV show that is produced, that the cast are well looked after, and it can be done. I promise you, it can yeah. be done. It can be just as entertaining. Just as entertaining, yes. Just as entertaining, just as addictive, and it's going to happen. I'm so stoked for it. Making changes. We're going to change this stuff. So. Before we go, is there any questions? I always like to give people uh, ask me anything at the end. Is there anything you want to ask me that you haven't already? What did you want to be when you wanted to grow up? Oh my gosh. So it's so weird because I, well, when I was a real little kid, I wanted to be a pro wrestler. Like a real WWE little kid. Pro wrestler. <laughs> pro wrestler. Yeah. Like WWE. Yeah. yeah. Like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then as I, as I got into like 10, 11, I was, I was going to be a screenwriter and a filmmaker. Okay, cool. Um, I was also interested in being president. Okay. So the theme that's always, yeah, that's They're always funny there. Grabs. Right, right. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. The thing that's so funny there is like, those are all like, you don't get famous for those things you get, your ideas get famous, you know, like you made this wonderful movie and blah, 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 blah. And people don't remember who directed it. Right. Or your president and you got, all of these great laws passed and you, you know, ended the uh, reset and people, they may know your name, but they know that this is what the president did for me. And then I get famous for my fucking relationship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You it's know like what's funny? the irony of it all. You're, you're almost like the WWE pro wrestler against reality TV in humanity laws. So smash, smash them down like Hulk Hogan did. And well, drop an elbow drop. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> elbow drop, slam it <laughs> across the table. And you know what's funny? Right. Like, WWE, everyone knows that it's fake. Do you know what I mean? But it's still entertaining. It's almost like with reality TV, people don't realize that it's produced or that it's manipulated or that it's edited. They think it's real. It's like, guys, think of it as like a WWE show. Like it's just it's yeah. Not it's not real. There's like elements of real, yeah. but they're all playing a character yes. to fit a narrative that they're there trying to tell, a storyline they're trying Done. to tell. Yeah. Okay. My other question that I love asking people is if you were to have dessert with anyone living or dead, who would it be and why? Anyone. Oh my could gosh. be famous, could okay. be in your family, could be anyone. You can pick two people if you can't choose just one. I would love to... Oh man, that's hard. It is. So I would, I, I would really love to sit down and have a conversation with Bernie Sanders. Okay. Um, here, here in the states, yes. because I he inspired me to like get politically active again and uh, work. On, I worked on his campaigns in 2016 and 2020, cool. and I just. I and I so the funny thing is, is I did get to meet him a couple of weeks ago in Chicago because he came out for a rally for our new mayor in Chicago 
And I got to meet the mayor because I was working on the campaign a little bit and got to say hi to Bernie. So that was like super cool. But to sit down and have a dessert would be so much fun. And then if I were to pick someone who's dead, I would probably, I really, really, really would love to talk to like George Carlin. Okay. Yeah. The, the comedian, I think he's so funny still. And I think he's like spot on, on his commentary. So I think that would be a fun one. Um, those are the ones that really come to mind. That's deep. The one thing I remember, um, the funniest thing I remember about Bernie Sanders is remember like that, um, meme of him when he was like all cold with the mittens. He's so cute. I love that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. There was a, there was a, I think it was Instagram or it might've just been an app where you could like place him yes. places. So I would yes. like, I, I was, placed him I in my living Snapchat, room. <laughs> that chat filter. Yeah. 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 Love and I that. like placed him in my living room. I placed him outside. I placed him sitting with me and my friends, like at restaurants. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the you best. can, you can virtually have dessert with him with that Snapchat filter. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. Well, Thank you so much for coming on. Can you tell people where to find you? And we'll put those links in the description as well. So if you want to follow my baking stuff, it is Alyssa Bakes Cakes. Um, My personal Instagram is Alyssa underscore Barmundi. Um, Yeah. And look, I do lots of stories. So if you want to see me be real annoying and have a trillion dots at the top, come and follow me. But yeah, lots of baking stuff, lots of lifestyle stuff being a single mom stuff and yeah, all of the great advocacy things that you're doing is, is awesome. And can't wait to scream it at the top of our lungs. So and I have one thing I want to say to you too, about being a single mom and dating. I can't imagine how hard that is, but like you have a great personality. You have so much energy. You Thank sound you. like you're a great mom Thanks. and there's someone out there that's going to look at that and fall in love with you because of that. Thank you. Nick. So, thank you. That. That's really kind. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you think, thanks again for coming on. We'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah, Maybe we can I'm talk in. about something else. <laughs> I'm, I'm available. One of the funny things as, as well from the show is I'm available every Wednesday and every other weekend that I got smashed for. So that's what I'm available <laughs> <laughs> And you need attention. I do need attention. Look, everyone needs attention. I just voice it. So go grab. I'll have to send you a sweatshirt of the I need attention. (laughs) You can proudly wear it through your Chicago winters. I definitely will do that. Awesome. Thanks, (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.